you would stand and join us as we sing.
those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountain surrounds Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore.
it's kind of a demonstration of how to track a deer during deer season. You're up in your deer stand, shoot one, you follow the blood trail and it watch for all the signs and things along the way. It'll lead you to your deer. And I want to tell you, I believe that God does that with us. And there are sometimes certain events that happen uh, where he's speaking to us. And like I said, I'd like to tell you that there's, God does this. The same thing, he gives us signs and signals to get our attention. Please don't think that I'm trying to say that every time something happens uh, that comes across the news that you need to find something God's telling or speaking to you. But there are sometimes events uh, where he is doing that. Uh, He did this time and time again in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel. And he's been doing this with us also. And I believe if you follow the signs and the trails and look at these events that I'm going to tell you about, uh, I believe you'll find God speaking to you and I. And that major event was not on 9-11 in 2001. That was when the towers, we were attacked. He was speaking to us as a nation and as individuals. Have you ever asked yourself why it was on the date of 9-11 that we were attacked? 9-11 was not an arbitrary date. God doesn't work that way. His timing is always perfect and with a purpose. And why the Twin Towers? Did you know they broke ground on the Pentagon on 9-11-1941? And also, Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson Bay on 9-11-1941. Henry Hudson sailed up that bay on a uh, ship called the Half Moon. I'm not trying to say that one single event brings judgment on any nation, but any nation that has been blessed as much as we have, there's consequences for pushing God away. For for, For instance, just one detail about this event. There are many more. Did you know when abortion was made legal in New York City? It was in 1970. And in 1973, it was made legal nationwide. Did you know that they broke grounds on the Twin Towers in 1970? And it was finished and completed in 1973. If you think these dates are random and that all of this, that, it, that it, this is all there is in these events, you're sadly mistaken. Remember that ship I just told you about, the Half Moon that Henry Hudson sailed up Hudson Bay on. Did you know there was a replica of that exact ship, the Half Moon, in the harbor on that very day that the Twin Towers fell? That is not something man can orchestrate. And also, if you think 9-11, 2001, to COVID-19 and 2020, which is a span of 19 years, is random, it's not. Our Father sometimes whispers to us. Sometimes when we're not listening, He shouts. 9-11 was a shout. In Ecclesiastes 1-6 to in the Good News Translation, it says, What has happened before will happen again. What has been done before will be done again. There is nothing new in the whole world. There is a pattern to life, just as Solomon says, that any nation or people that has known God and turned away from Him will suffer the same fate as Uh, the ancient nation of Israel did. All scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. The point of telling you about all of this following this trail, can you see God's fingerprint on all of this? What is he saying to you as an individual and to us as a nation? Any nation and people that God has blessed so much and cared for so greatly as God has done for us, then starts pushing him out. It doesn't go so well. As Solomon said, nothing new under the whole world, but there is one thing that can change that cycle for you and I, and it is only through the cross of Jesus Christ 
that this coming judgment can be broken. He took the wrath we so justly deserved and took it upon himself. Are we willing to look at these cycles and patterns? Are there any 9-11 events in your life that God is trying to get your attention? Remember Mark said a few weeks ago, every knee will bow. Will it be to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or away from me, for I never knew you? As we come to this part of our service, we have just finished praising God with our singing we, and worshiped. Now we need to reflect on how has our walk brought glory to God this week for what he did for us on the cross. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would each examine our lives and turn to you, not let it be a 9-11 event in our lives, but hear that whisper and turn to you to the cross and ask for your forgiveness. May it not be that we have to have a 9-11 event in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, I pray that we have our hearts and our minds ready for the message that Mark is getting ready to deliver. I pray that we will honor you and glorify your name this week as we live out our life here and be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, good morning. How you doing? Hey, I, if you have a Bible, turn to Habakkuk. <laughs> Or if you like Habakkuk, actually it's Habakkuk. As, now, if you don't know where it is, it's neatly sandwiched between Nahum and Zephaniah. Because that's going to be easy for you to find, or you have a table of contents. So and I said it because, for one thing, our U version is down today, so we don't have that. Today's a special day, and there are four reasons it's a special day. Okay, number one, most importantly, this, this is Sunday. Hello? It's Sunday, and the church is gathered, and we sing songs of praise. We'll study the Word of God. We've had the Lord's Supper. It's Sunday. That's a special day. Number two, this is, come on up here if you would, please, Corinth. This is Corinth, uh, Corinth Weston's last Sunday with us. Before she goes to Bible College at Ozark Christian College, Joplin, Missouri, studying for the worship ministry, and we're proud of her. I, I, that was your, yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. God, thanks for Corinth. She's been a great blessing to us. I pray she'd be a blessing to Ozark as well. Uh, use her as she trains and serves down there. Thank you for Corinth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. <laughs> you might also pray for Ozark Christian College. <laughs> I, just to be fair, you know, I think it's, that's right. So that's two reasons. It's Sunday. It's Corinth's last day. Was she goes to college. Number three, today is January 8th, which is? Elvis's birthday. Huh? Which reminds me, it's also my wedding anniversary. Very sharp getting married on Elvis's birthday. And somebody said, Well, how long have you been married? And I say, Well, that's really none of your business. <clears throat> I, I don't like, tell people how long I've been married because then they assume I married Julie when she was the captain of the junior high cheerleading team. And there's, there's an age difference between us, but it's not 50 years or 20 years, it's, it's not that much. In fact, we were out to eat the other night, Friday night, to celebrate this anniversary, and somehow the waitress knew it was our anniversary, and Julie said to her, how long do you think we've been married? I said, oh, don't ask that question. And, and she said, no. And I, Julie said, no. I said, no, please don't. And so the waitress said, and she guessed it on the money, which made me feel really old. 
okay? And ever, it seems like every compliment I get at this point in my life comes with this caveat, for someone your age. You know, you get around pretty well for somebody your age. I mean, you look okay for, for somebody your age. Your, your health seems pretty good for someone your age. <clears throat> well, I've decided I'm going to get on a new exercise program that's suitable for someone my age. And I started last, the first of the year. And I, I, here's what I did. I start with, it's a, it's a pretty involved program. I got uh, two five-pound uh, potato sacks, and I hold them straight out like this. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried this or not. That's not as easy as it looks. Okay, I hold those sacks out there like that. It, it makes your chest cavity burn. It works your abs. Your arms begin to tremble. Uh, and I've done it for a week, and I've gotten where, believe it or not, in one week, I can do it. I, I thought there'd be, surely be applause. <laughs> That's pretty good. And this week, I move up to 10-pound potato sacks. Whew. And I don't know how long it'll take me to get that done. If I get that done, I moved up to 20-pound potato sacks. When I get 20-pound potato sacks done, then I'm going to put a potato in each sack, <laughs> which will make it considerably more difficult. This week was tough as it was. Sorry about that. It wasn't right, was it? The Bible says physical, physical training is good. It profits a little bit, but godliness is profitable in all things. And I, I really want to have a healthy body. I want to die healthy. Anybody else? I want to die healthy and in my right mind. It's not too much to ask for. And I don't know if I'll be able to pull that off because I know the body, no matter what you do, that it's not going in a great direction. But more importantly... I want to have my faith grow from now until the time I leave this planet and don't need faith anymore. I want to have a stronger faith because tough times demand a tough faith. And so I want my faith to grow this year. Matthew chapter 13 says this, Jesus speaking, the seed on rocky soil, the word of God represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy. And most of you have done that. But since we, they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Tough times require a tough faith. So this series out of Habakkuk is a, a study of faith and how to have the tough faith that kind of makes it through, through the hard times. We're going to look at three chapters. Today it's wondering, what in the world are you doing, God? Next week it's waiting on God to, to really show. And finally it moves to worship. But there's this, this process through the book. It's an unusual book. Of all the prophets, Habakkuk is different than all the others because in this book he never preaches. Uh, Hab- Preachers, prophets are preachers. They usually scald the people, like John was talking about. Here's what you've done wrong. Here's what God's going to do. That's exactly the Old Testament prophets, most of them do. Habakkuk isn't like that. Habakkuk does this. He says, God, what are you doing? It's not, his problem is with God, not with the people. So it's an unusual book that way. So let me read the first four verses, and you follow along if you would. Habakkuk chapter 1. It says, this is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen. Okay, you ever felt that way, God? I'm praying, I'm asking, and you're not listening. Violence is everywhere I cry, but you do not come to save. Violence in the classroom, violence in the street. Must I forever see evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. Hello? Do you, do you see that? I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. And they'll pick a fight about anything. And we have professional fighters. We call them lawyers. And I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. Come on now. The law has become paralyzed. There's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. People still ask questions like that all the time. God, what are you doing? God, why don't you do this? <clears throat> Does it seem to you that evil people... God, why do the evil people get by? Why do evil people... Evil people prosper, and the good people suffer. God, what's, what's going on? Why does that old reprobate live to be 102? You don't ever see that on the news? He's 102 years old. He's been rising, he's rotten life. And then a 42-year-old man who loves his family gets killed in a car accident. What? God, what's going on? doesn't make any sense. God, we tried to raise our kids by your word. We, we brought them to church. We taught them the best we could. And now they're a mess. They've left the house, and they're, they're a wreck. And there's other people that they didn't even try. And look, their kids are doing, doing fine. What's going on? God, I'm, I'm financially, I'm trying to follow your word. I'm trying to give. I'm trying to, to save a little bit. But there's not enough money. And meanwhile, the guy next to me, he's got more than he wants, more than he needs. I, I go to work. 
God, I go to work, I work hard, but this self-promoter, he's the one who gets a promotion. I don't, I don't get anything. God, what's, what's going on? Why is it, does this sound familiar to anybody yet? <laughs> why, why do I have to battle with depression? Why can't I sleep through the night? What, God, what's going on? And here's a good one. God, I pray and I ask, but you just don't do what I ask. God, are you even listening? You could do something, but you don't. Why not? Now, Habakkuk is a committed believer. He's bothered by what he sees in the world that doesn't rhyme with what he believes about God. You ever been there? God, I believe this about you. I believe you're good. I believe you're in charge. But this thing's going on. Why is this going on? God, what? Here's a little context for you. Habakkuk, he's called a minor prophet only because it's a short book, just three little chapters. He wrote about the year 600 B.C. Israel, the northern tribes, had been taken away in captivity. Judah in the south are doing okay. Under Josiah, there was a great revival. They slipped toward idolatry, but began to do the right things. The nation went well. Josiah died. And the nation slipped back into idolatry, rebellion. And there's violence in the streets. Things are terrible. And he is praying for revival. God, let's go. Clean this out. Make this better. Help these people. That's what he's praying about. Habakkuk means to embrace or wrestle. But Habakkuk is not a sitcom sermon. I like sitcoms. Anybody else? We can list a bunch of them we like, but I, you know, here's the basic recipe for a sitcom. A little bit of humor, a little bit of tension, and 24 minutes later without the commercials, everybody's happy. <laughs> Over the lunch hour one day this week, I watched episode, season one, episode one of Mary Tyler Moore. What a happy time. You know, there's a little bit of problem, but by the end of the show, everything's good. And I've got eight more seasons to watch. <clears throat> Maybe not. This is not a sitcom sermon where there's a little bit of tension, everything, you know, and then boom, everybody's happy, a little humor. No, it's not that way at all. In fact, it goes this way. There's a little tension, then there's a drama, and then there's some unanswered question. God, what are you doing? Why doesn't this work? In fact, he argues with God. This just doesn't seem right. God, why is it this girl sleeps around all over the place and has ba- she gets pregnant time and time again, she aborts those children, and here's a godly couple, and they want children, and they can't have them. God, what are you doing? doing. Now, that may sound sacrilegious. What you're really saying is, God, if I were you, I think I could do a better job. Hello? When you put it that way, that sounds crazy. But God, if I were you, I I don't know what you're doing. This doesn't make any sense. Is it okay to ask God that question? What do you think? Well, you read the Psalms, about a third of the Psalms, that's what they're doing. You read the book of Job, and all through the book of Job, Job is saying to God, this is not right. You need to do something different. Even Jesus on the cross said, God, why have you forsaken me. In fact, it's not just okay to ask that question. It's actually a necessary building step to real faith. In fact, I I think if you've never had a doubt, you probably don't have much faith. I want to show you a little chart. It's called the dip. And Here's what, at the bottom left of the chart, that's where you start out in Christ. You you come to Christ, things are probably going bad in your life, things are rotten, and you got trouble, but you say, you know what, I do believe that Jesus is the Christ, I, I, I'm going to glyph for him, you repent of your sins, you're baptized in Christ, and boom, you rise the chart up to that first little rise. And you think, man, life is good. I mean, it's so great to be a Christian. You go outside, the sun shines, the colors are beautiful and bright. You go to church, and the music, and the song just really hits you. And the sermon is preached, and it's like you and God having a private dialogue. And you think, man, this is tremendous. You pray, and, and God does whatever you ask him to do. You get in the car, your favorite, stations, favorite song's on the radio, you pull up to Walmart, there's a brand new parking place right up front. They got your name on there. You just slide in, things are good. And that works for a while. But what happens, eventually, we all hit the dip, okay? And you go down. And then you go to church, and the music is going, why did they sing that song? And is that preacher still talking? I haven't heard a word yet. He just keeps on rambling away. I pray, nothing happens. <clears throat> I get in the car, the radio won't even work. Okay, I go to Walmart, I got to park in the back, so they get out of the car, the thunderstorm comes, and I'm drenched, and you're walking up there going, God, what is going on? I, I, somebody I love gets sick, I pray, and they die, and you're in that trough. That's a bad place to be. So what do you do when you're in the, in the dip? Let me just ask, how many of you have been in the dip? How many of you, just, can I just get a, an honest somebody? I, I've been in the dip. Okay, and those of you who are afraid to raise your hands in church, I don't blame you, because you could get called on. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, if you've been a Christian for long, you, you've been to the dip. What do you do when you get to the dip? Well, you have three choices. Number one, you could deny reality. 
And I know a lot of Christians like this who just put on a happy face and go, everything is wonderful when your life is terrible. Okay? You can try to live that way for a while, but it is not a, <clears throat> not a good choice. So some people do that. They just try to deny it. Other people simply walk away from the faith. And I've seen a lot of people in my life who became Christians, just like the rocky soil, but when the dip came, they just walked away and said, well, this is not working for me. And I don't know if there are other people who are lying about it or not. Maybe they're lying. Maybe they're not even telling the truth, but I, I, this doesn't work, and I'm, I'm out of here. Or you can lean into God in the midst of the dip. Now, the good news is if you lean into God in your dip, he will take you to, to new heights. Whoop. <laughs> and there will be a greater intimacy at the end than there ever was in that first little rise. I can honestly tell you this, that the 40th year of marriage is better than the fourth year of marriage if you work at it. Now, I thought we, were, we got married in a fever, hotter than a pepper sprout. We went down to Jackson. Every till the fire went out. And I, and it was great when we got married. And the fourth year of marriage, I think that's the year Luke was born. You know, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm telling you, the 40th year is better than the fourth. But to get to the... And the 40th year, you've got to go through the dip. Now, I know we have young people in the house. Some of you are looking at getting married. Can I just tell you that after you get married, there's going to be a dip? And I thought all the people have been married a long time ago. Amen. <laughs> Am I wrong? There's going to be a dip. You're not going to be on the mountaintop every day. There will be a dip. What do you do when the dip comes? James chapter 1. Consider all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Some of you are in the dip right now, and you're asking the very same questions Habakkuk asked. And yet, well, he gave all those questions, the first four verses. Did God answer him? Yes, he did. Now, most of the time, when you ask those questions, God is not going to answer. You know that? You're just going to have to live with the, with the questions. But he answers them, and it's in verse 5. The Lord replied... Look around the nations, look, be amazed. I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone were to tell you about it. Now, we always want the answer is, God, why, why, why? And usually God says, not telling you why, but this time he says to Habakkuk, here's, here's the reason. Okay, verse 6, I'm raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world to conquer other lands. They're notorious for their cruelty. They do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs or fiercer than wolves at dusk. Charioteers charge from far away like eagles. They swoop down. They devour their prey. Oh, they come, all bent on violence. On their hordes, uh, their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes. They scorn all their fortresses. They pile up ramps of earth against the walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. But they are deeply guilty for their own strength as their God. So Habakkuk says, God, why? What's going on? And God says, You want the news? Here it is. I'm sending the Babylonians to chastise you and to teach you to do better. The Babylonians? Well, that's what he says, verse 12. Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you don't plan to wipe us out. Oh, Lord, our rock, you've sent the Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you're pure. You cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Are we only fish to be caught on a hook? To be caught and killed, are they only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they'll worship their... Here's how evil they are. They will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who have made us rich, they'll claim. We let them get away with this forever. Will they succeed forever in their, their conquest? God, he goes from, aren't you doing anything to God? How could you? How could you possibly send these folks after us? Now, that's my sermon for the day. That's just about it. I mean, because you will be, it's, it's a sermon in the dip. Bad times. Habakkuk sets an example, and there are three truths that come from his example for people in the dip. First is this, overcoming faith wrestles with the mysteries of life. If you want faith that goes a distance, that makes any difference in your life, it will have to overcome the, deal with the mysteries of life. A deeply committed Christian can ask questions and have doubts at the same time. In fact, doubt is the source of faith. See, Habakkuk still believes in God, but the circumstances have rocked his faith. Here's, here's what I believe about God. Here's what I see in the world. How can I make any sense of this? He couldn't reconcile them. 
The problem of evil has challenged us. We see a little prayer, God is great, God is good. Okay? And I, I believe both. Some people just believe one of those. Some people just believe God is great, but he's not too good. I just believe God's good, but he can't do much. I believe God is great and God is good. If that's true, why is there so much evil in the world? Now, that wouldn't be a problem for Habakkuk's neighbors who believed in many gods, because maybe this God's stronger. Or maybe they believe in a God who just created the world and walked away. And the atheist has no problem with evil. Why would he expect anything good? But if you believe in God, why is there so much evil in the world? But Habakkuk is a believer. In fact, every day, he would have said a little prayer called the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6. It goes like this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And therefore, he wrestles with the problem of evil. And again, understanding why it happens isn't going to be much help. God, don't you care, and how is this fair? Tough times reveal a flaw in our faith. And the flaw is this. We somehow think that God exists to give us the life we want. I'm going to say it again. It, the flaw of our faith is this. We think God exists to give us the life we want. Could I be real honest with you? That is not taught in the Bible. Okay? That's not what the Bible is about. It's not what God is about. It's not what you're about. Okay? It's really about him, and it's not about us. In the midst of his suffering in question, Job wrote this, Job 13. God might kill me, but I have no, no other hope. I'm going to argue my case with him. And so he wrestles with the mysteries of life. And overcoming faith, number two, takes the mysteries and runs to God rather than running away. It's easy to run away, but he runs to God. You may wrestle with God, but regardless of what's going on, try to hold on. Let me just give you a glimmer of hope in chapter 2 and verse 1. Habakkuk says this. I'll climb up to my watchtower, stand at my guard post. I'll wait to see what the Lord says, how he'll answer my complaint. And what he, what he basically says, God, I'm not going away. I, I know I don't understand this. It makes no sense to me. What you're doing just is mind-boggling. I don't know why you don't do better. But God, I'm not, I'm not going away. I'm sticking with you through this. God welcomes hard questions. Doubt and faith really go together. I love the story of Mark chapter 9. Jesus is up on a mountain praying with a couple of disciples. A man with a demon-possessed son comes to Jesus, to his disciples, and said, can you cast the demon out? And they try, but they cannot. And so Jesus comes down the mountain, and the man says, Jesus, my, the demon possesses him. He throws him into the fire, into the water. He's going he's gonna to die someday. Your disciples couldn't do anything. And in Mark 9, 22, have mercy on us, he said to Jesus, if you can. Ever think that, God, if you can. And I think with a chuckle, Jesus said, well, what do you mean, if I can? Anything's possible, the person that believes. And the father cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And maybe that's where you are today. God, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Help me to keep on believing. Sometimes it's hard. <clears throat> Life is hard because I'm trapped in this body. This old song, this robe of prison of clay. Anybody trapped in a body? And because of that, sometimes... For you young people, could I just tell you this? Enjoy. Enjoy that, you know, you get up and everything feels good. Just enjoy. It's not always going to be that way. And I'm trapped in a, in a decaying old carcass. I am. And I got stuff that doesn't work like it ought to work. <clears throat> That's from going to bed. I didn't, I didn't do anything else except try to sleep. It, and because of that, I, you'd think, that's just my body. I, I do not believe I am a body. I believe I am a living soul inside this old body. My grandma told me, she said, I'm a young lady inside this 80-year-old body. Good for you, grandma. Don't look too young. <clears throat> I'm trapped in this thing, and it messes with me. When it, when, when I, listen, I know none of you have pain, but when you have pain, you'll, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to be right in the mind when the body's not right. And then I have these fickle emotions I can't do much about. I love the old song. It says, I woke up this morning feeling fine. Well, I woke up on Thursday morning feeling terrible. You ever have one of those? And there was nothing wrong. Nothing happened overnight. I was happy when I went to bed Wednesday night. I got up grumpy on Thursday. I don't know what happened. Life was terrible. That's what was wrong. You know why? Because I got fickle emotions. And we're trapped in these bodies with these fickle emotions, and sometimes it's hard. Don't 
leave, keep on, run to God, not away from God with your problems. And here's the third thing. Overcoming faith views the mysteries of life through the lens of God's character. There will always be some mystery to faith or you wouldn't need faith at all. I like what Rick actually says. It makes total sense that God does not make total sense to me. Of course we don't understand him. Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts, says God, nor are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth and my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. A couple of weeks ago we had a, had a little problem. Uh, it was cold. Remember how cold it was? I mean, it snowed. And if you walk down a sidewalk and you walk on a solid sheet of ice, you, your chance of staying up aren't good. And so I would, I would just advise you, when you walk down a sidewalk and it's partially cleared, try to step on the parts that are cleared. Aren't you glad you came today? Because if, if you put your weight down on that icy spot, you're going to have trouble. And Habakkuk says, I'm not going to put my weight on the icy spot of my questions. I'm going to put my weight on the, what I know to be true about the character of Almighty God. Verse 12, O Lord my God, my Holy One, you are eternal. I'll tell you this about God. He has always been. He will always be. He's never caught by surprise. He's not going away. Surely you don't plan to wipe us out. God, I know your plans are good. They can't be evil. O Lord, our rock, you're our refuge. You've sent the Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our sins. I, I know that. But you're pure. God, you're, you're pure. You're holy. Can't stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up the people more righteous than they? No, God, because you're, you're holy, you're righteous, you're just, you're eternal, and I trust you. Faith that overcomes wrestles with the mysteries of life. It runs to God and trusts his character. So here's a question for the morning. How's your faith in the dip? How's your faith? I want to close with the story from 1939. It was the summer of 1939, and a preacher by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse was barnstorming through Europe preaching revivals. He was from Philadelphia. And he is a very good preacher, and he, he preached all over. And at the end of August, he had a week off before he was supposed to go to Belfast, Ireland, first week of September for another revival. And he took his family to a beach in France, uh, to Normandy Beach, by the way, the photos he took of his beach were useful to our government in planning the Normandy invasion. On the way there, people said, you may not get back because the tensions were high and war was imminent and people knew it. He was there for a week. He got ready to go back home, with the, or back to Ireland. Planes wouldn't fly because of the, the tension and because war was on the horizon. In fact, uh, that week, Hitler had invaded Danzig, and the prime minister of Britain Neville Chamberlain said this, if the Germans are not out of Danzig by 11 o'clock Sunday morning, war is going to be declared. Well, he couldn't get a flight back, so he took trains and then a boat. Finally got to London. When he got to London, the train he was getting on was full of children because they were evacuating children because of the threat of war. He didn't want the children in London when the bombs began to fall. So he took the train. He went up north, took a boat across the water, finally arrived at Belfast, Ireland, 3 o'clock in the morning, supposed to preach the next morning uh, for the church service. One of the guys that met him at the boat said this, I hope you'll have a good sermon, don't we always? It may, it may well be the last one some of these men will ever hear. A lot of pressure. He went to the hotel room that night at 4 o'clock in the morning. He wrote a brief outline. He later said, I stood there and I prayed and suddenly I thought of the perfect text for the hour. I wrote down a few thoughts and went to bed. Sunday morning, September 3rd, 1939, he goes to church and the preacher says, the church will be full of lads who will never come back. I pray God will give you something for them today. And he thought, well, they won't, the church won't be full. Because at 11 o'clock is church, 11 o'clock is Chamberlain's message on the radio. People will stay home and listen to the radio and see if they're going to war. But he was surprised he got to church. The place was packed, every seat full. And they had sang the songs, the worship was going on. And, and then a note was handed to the preacher. And the preacher handed the note to Barnhouse. The note read, no reply from Hitler. The prime minister has declared war. A moment later, Barnhouse rose to preach. Despite the circumstances, he said, I have a text that God has given me for the hour. I think it's the right text for the hour, September 3rd, 1939. Spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a command. Matthew 24, you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled. He went on to tell them, some of the young men in this audience will leave here and never come back. But be not troubled. Some of your homes will face grief like you've never known before, but be not troubled. Bombs will fly maybe in this, even, in this area, but be not troubled. And they looked at him like, this man, he's, he said, you know what, those words are either the words of a madman or the words of Almighty God. 
I believe that Jesus is God. And therefore, even when there's tremors, tremors and rumors of war, be not troubled. That's the lesson of Habakkuk. The lesson of Habakkuk is God is the God of history. You do not need to fret. And it may not make sense to you now. <laughs> and I, I, a zillion times in my life, I've told God, this does not make sense. Doesn't make sense now. But Habakkuk, in the midst of that, questions God, said, God, but I still believe. Let me pray for those of you who are in the dip right now. Hey, by the way, come back next week. Come back in two more weeks, because Habakkuk gets happier. <laughs> God, I want to pray for people that are in the midst of the dip right now, and they're struggling to find you, struggling to stay with you, and, and life is shooting craps on them. Things aren't going like they ought to. Their bodies don't feel well. Their relationships are soured. The money's tight. It just doesn't look like there's much good going on. Father, I'm thankful that you can, you can take it when we bring our questions to you. And God, I know you don't often give us a specific answer for what's going on right now, but help us in the midst of our questioning to run to you and to trust you because we believe that you're almighty God and you're in control of history and you have good plans for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey everybody, thanks for coming to church today. We are so glad you're here. I have a few announcements for you guys. First off, for all you high schoolers out there, youth group starts back up tonight at the Legion from 5 to 7, so make sure to be there. Kids Stuff and Junior High Group is going to start back up on January 11th, which is this Wednesday from 5.30 to 7 at the church. Our next Super Wow is going to be on February 8th, and it's going to be a worship night, so it's going to be super exciting, so make sure to be there. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Get out of here.